I am truly thrilled to present this message at the cross. You can be sure of one thing. This message is life-changing, and so you should expect God to do something powerful. I mean, even supernatural, as you take in this truth based on Christ's victory at the cross. You know, a few weeks ago, I said goodbye to a hero of mine, my spiritual mentor, advisor, my teacher, my mom. Most people around me didn't even know the pain, the grief and sorrow that Pam and my family and I had been dealing with with, for over six years. But out of this great trial and difficulty, God has lavished his mysterious grace upon us by a spiritual focus that converts grief and sorrow into joy unspeakable. It turns scorched earth and burnt ashes into pure beauty. It brings hope to the hopeless, This life focus will turn addiction, captivity, and shame into freedom. It's my pleasure to give you this secret spiritual focus that converts a sinner into a child of God and can lift a single mom like my mom from this fragile life to the unfailing immortality of being perfect, whole, and in the presence of Jesus. The secret, you ask, what's the key? It's a persistent, unrelenting focus on Jesus' victory at the cross. So together, let's peel off all the traditions and the man-made ideas that obscure the power of God's will for each one of us at the cross. There's an applause in heaven that roars and is waiting for you when you unveil the secret and fix your focus to comprehend all that Jesus has accomplished at the cross. But we need the Holy Spirit's help. Let's ask him right now. Precious Lord, help us. Help us in the name of Jesus to get a revelation of the mystery of what Jesus accomplished at the cross in your precious name. Amen. I want to help answer the question, can the curse be turned into a blessing in your life? To begin, we need some background. Where did the, where did the cross come from and why is it this great symbol of hope? You know, today we have organizations using symbols like the Red Cross, which is a humanitarian organization. There's the Blue Cross, a national health insurance company of all things. We see beautiful crosses fixed upon architectural wonders like cathedrals and church buildings. Many people wear a gold or a silver cross around their neck as a representation of their faith. But none of this means anything if we don't truly know where the cross came from in the first place, and in spite of our sanitized, artistic, almost clinical view of the cross today, the beginning of its story, it has a harsh, bitter, very dark reality. Just like the undeniable reality of humanity's sin and rebellion, our undeniable need of a Savior to redeem us from the curse, a grip of death and hell until, until the victory of all unimaginable victories at the cross. So let's get real about the history of the cross. I mean, the real story, folks. The cross was a gruesome tool of execution. We get our word excruciating from the word crucifixion, meaning a pain like the worst agony of dying on the cross. Death by crucifixion was meant to be the most painful, horrifying, slow, humiliating death possible. Thousands of years ago, the Romans perfected this form of execution and used it mostly for slaves, the worst criminals, terrorists, and enemies of the state. They wanted to intimidate people. The victim would slowly suffocate, possibly having a cardiac rupture, heart failure, pulmonary embolism. Make no mistake, The cross was intended to torture and to be such a gruesome death that it put fear in everybody's heart to obey, to submit to the authorities. The cross was not a symbol of hope, but of terror for society thousands of years ago. This execution tool was employed by armies, dictators to bring submission, fear, compliance. But my friend, my friend, then Jesus, but then Jesus, he took our worst and did the very best. More than just two straight edges brought into an intersection, it's Christ's victory over the curse. If you like to think that gold crosses around the neck are blessed, it's because of Jesus. If you think the red cross is a symbol of hope, It's because of Jesus. That cross on top of the cathedral that symbolizes life over death, it's all because of Jesus' victory. 
So why would Jesus turn the curse into the blessing? And for whom? In life, the why is far more important than the how. People know how to make a profit, but they don't know why, so they self-destruct. People know how to have children, but they don't know why, so their kids are twice as lost as they are. People know how to get married. They're just confused about why. So they live in this state of unhappy compromise, so close but so far, and hopefully next time will be better. Listen carefully. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Jesus intentionally suffered the cross that he might turn the curse into a blessing. Why? For you. Why? Because God loves you. Jesus' sacrifice was a legal transaction that gave him full jurisdiction over the law of sin and death and the law of life so that you might authorize him to do a legal exchange on your behalf if you choose him. Imagine that. God paying the price to redeem you and me from our sins. Where? At the cross. Deuteronomy 23, verse 5. The Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God has loved you. Oh, one of the greatest keys to life in Christ is this. Jesus turned the curse into a blessing for you because God so loves you. Is that enough to satisfy the answer to your why? Well, how about one more for my legal friends? Romans 8, verses 1 through 3. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh." The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Translation of that, Jesus turned the curse into a blessing for you. Legally, at the cross, he dealt with our condemnation. So how did he do this? I, I know you're asking how. I'm asking too. By becoming a curse in our place. Yes, he became a curse. Jesus became a curse. How did he do such a thing? How did such a perfect savior do such a thing? Well, look at Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written. This is a law. It's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Okay, so there's our doctrine confirmed at confirming at the cross. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That means trust and reliance on Him. I have to say it again because it's such an extraordinary, phenomenal, amazing gift of God. Christ didn't just die for your sin. No, Jesus intentionally became a curse Quote, a curse for us, for you, for me. Why? So that you might be blessed and receive the promise of his spirit. Wow. Truly amazing. That is amazing grace. You know that song, Amazing Grace? This is the epitome of amazing grace. The cross is the story of amazing grace. And you must understand this. God only gives that promise to his children, not servants. So, we have two fundamental eternal policies that God has revealed to us at this point. Don't you love it? Number one, you are under the curse of the law of sin and death until, until Christ Jesus redeems you. And then number two, God wants you blessed, period. My friend, it's his will. It's his word. It's child of God's status for you and for me. So let's talk for a few minutes about the reality of this curse, because if you don't believe in a curse, it's hard to believe that you need to be saved from one. Proverbs 26, verse 2, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Is there really such a thing, Pastor Stephen, as a curse? Come on, you have to ask? 
You see what people do to each other on a battlefield and it's dreadful, scary, monstrous. We see what sickness does to the helpless life, how poverty robs little children. We see corruption in government, disloyalty in marriage, dishonesty in the church, the love of money, the hatred of the unborn, the lust for even more and more immorality. Children don't need to be taught how to lie, do they? I knew I, I, I came by it naturally. The children don't need to be selfish. I came by it naturally. It's just easy. Romans 7, verse 15, Paul said this. He said, I do not understand myself. This is Paul the apostle talking about himself. He said, I do not understand myself. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, that's what I do. How many of us have asked ourselves the same questions? Sin, sickness, sorrow, shame, lack, disease, death, destruction. They're all part and parcel of the curse. So is there a curse? Of course the curse is real. You know that. But God's blessing is stronger. From the fall of disobedience in the Garden of Eden to now, the history of humanity has been marked by so much shame and pain and dishonor, sin, all evidence of the curse. But Christ... Oh, I had to get it in, but Christ, I saw it coming. Yes, Christ has redeemed us from the curse being made a curse for us, for that blessing might come on us legally. That blessing should come us on us legally. That's the only way it can, rightfully ours in Christ Jesus, all because of the love of God, because of God's love for you and me. Jesus turned the curse inside out by becoming a curse for us. How did he do that? By himself hanging on the tree, hanging on the cross, spiritual laminin. So here's the gospel. Here's the good news. This is why the good news is so good and it's so amazing. Listen to this. Jesus was born of a virgin, 100% God, and being born of a woman, he was also 100% man. He was without sin. His blood was supplied by God, not man. God's word was the seed and his body was supplied by the Virgin Mary. Luke chapter two says that Jesus grew in stature and he had to grow in favor with God and with man. Oh boy, he walked the earth doing good, good things, signs and wonders, healing, helping, forgiving and restoring. And after three and a half years of excellent ministry, the religious leaders manipulated the Roman government into crucifying Jesus on a cross. For no crimes, no sins, the perfect son of God died the most humiliating, cruel form of execution ever invented on planet earth. So why do I say he did it in our place? Because the Bible, the biblical law of sin and death says that the only way to pay for sin is with death. The cost of sin, any sin, is death. Look at Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our culture teaches a lie. You want what's fair. You want what you deserve. Trust me, you do not want what you deserve or what's fair. You want God's gift of grace, his mercy. You want what you don't deserve, the love of God. The world's lateral system has tricked humanity into this fairness demand. It's a joke. And do you know who's laughing the loudest? That's right, the great deceiver, Lucifer, the devil. Oh, but then Jesus, the truth. Jesus took our place and didn't just die. No, no. He suffered the cross, becoming a curse for us. He was put in a borrowed grave. He descended into hell and dispossessed the devil of the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Jesus took all jurisdiction away from the devil once and for all. And Matthew 28, verse 18 says, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And on the third day, says that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus up alive and full of glory to the right hand of God the Father, where he now reigns with a name that is far above every other name. His name is Jesus, and there is nobody in all of eternity that can set you free from the curse but Jesus. Jesus not only sets us free, friend, he not only sets us free from the curse, but he sets us free for the blessing. So how did this amazing grace miracle happen? Well, we know why, because God so loves us. Because so God loves you. 
Just take a moment and soak in. Soak that into your heart. God so loved you. That's why he gave his only begotten son. Okay, here we go. This is utterly amazing how God made this happen. I'm telling you, God is the absolute genius of all intelligent design. He is majestic, awesome, and yes, amazing. Jesus himself spoke this to the leaders of the day. John 3, famous chapter, John 3, but we'll start at verse 14 through to verse 16. Listen to this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, the famous one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So why a snake on a pole? What kind of weird symbolism is that? Remember, it was the serpent in the Garden of Eden that initiated the great fall. Remember that in Genesis 3? God cursed the serpent to crawl as almost the epitome or representation of the curse. But God had a big plan, a bigger plan to not just stop the curse, but reverse the curse, to reverse its effect. So God sent his son, his only begotten son, to humble himself, take the place of mankind, and even allow all the curse, the sin, to come in upon him, making him sin, to take all the sickness and disease, being made sin. This is hard for people to, to believe because it conflicts with their sense and reason. But Jesus actually tells us that just like the snake was lifted up, Jesus is talking. He says, just like the snake was lifted up on the pole, so he too, me, talking about the Savior, must be lifted up on the tree. The foreshadowing of Christ becoming sin for us and being lifted up is centric to delivering us all from the curse of sin. See, Jesus didn't want to just pay for your sin. He wanted to pay for the curse of it too. You can't have the blessing without this. There is a spiritual law that says, cursed is he who hangs on the tree. That's from Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. That's the law they're talking about. In the book of Numbers 21, venomous snakes were biting the people of Israel and many were dying. Moses asked God, what am I going to do to get rid of all these snakes? I got to stop this curse. Numbers 21, verse 8, look at this. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent of bronze, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten will live when he looks at it. Remember, Snakes are under the curse, the epitome of the curse, resigned to eat dirt, so to speak. We also know the law says cursed is the one who hangs on the tree or the pole. So God Almighty introduced an amazing act of his genius by hanging the curse on the curse. It becomes the antidote for the people. It is the anti-venom, anti-curse cure. Oh, that's good. Now we have Jesus saying, I must be hung on a cross like Moses hung the snake. And here's the crucial point. We must look on him and believe on him, Jesus. We must look at now the empty cross because Jesus raised up from the grave alive and we must believe on him. Remember what we've already discovered in Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Can we read it again? Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on a tree on the cross. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles so that we would all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. And can I just chase it with this? One of my all-time favorite scriptures, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He made Christ, that's God, God made Christ who knew no sin to judicially be sin on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him by his gracious loving kindness. Listen to this. It would not have worked if Jesus hung on the cross without all of our sin and sickness being on him. The perfect son of man had to take our place and that meant he had to have spiritually transferred onto his person all of our sin, guilt, all of our shame, all of our sickness and perversion. Jesus bore it all. You name it, Jesus paid all of it at the cross. 
you get his blessing. I get his blessing because he perfectly redeemed you and me from the curse. Where? At the cross. You get what Jesus deserves and not what you deserve. Why? Because Jesus sacrificed at the cross. You can be free from all illegitimacy and be a child of Almighty God. Blessed. Blessed. Where? At the cross. Do you want to accept the work Jesus did for you at the cross today? Of course you do. Who doesn't want the gift of freedom when you're trapped, when you're bound? Do you want to live free from the curse, free for the blessing? Pray this prayer with me. Simple prayer, but engage your faith. Dear Lord Jesus, here I am at the cross. I surrender all my life. You died in my place. Forgive me. You rose up from the grave. You're alive. You conquered the curse for me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you. In your name, Jesus. Amen.